right, all right. Um, so I know it's recording, but we can edit this. Um, I could actually yeah. one sec. Oh, if we go. Oh, they're they're coming yeah, in now. There's some folks, yeah. Okay, cool. Hello, hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute or so. Thank you for joining our workshop tonight. It's going to be awesome for sure. Uh, Brad, you were you were a hit on that first the first one, and so <laughs> uh, I I walked away with so much information on the first workshop, man. I'm, I was I had to go back and look at the video a couple times. I still need to go back and look at it again, but it was just mind blown, mind blown. So if anybody missed the first workshop with Brad on AI um, and you're interested in seeing it, you know, just uh, contact us. We can send you that recording, but uh, it was it was pretty awesome. I think you, you had me thinking for the last couple of weeks and, That's uh, and I, <laughs> I was telling everyone like, hey, you guys don't know about this, you really do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, from my kids to, you know, family to friends to strangers, I was, you know, really, really, really uh, pulled by all the information you gave last time. So I def I'm making a plug for anybody that missed it because you definitely want to see that first one. It was amazing. And you're in for a treat tonight. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll get started here just in about 30 seconds or so. Really appreciate all of you being with us tonight. Again, we are recording it, uh, but, uh, you know, it's nothing like being live. Nothing like being live. So uh, thank you all for joining us 110%. And we'll get started just in a few seconds here. All right. All right. You know what? Without further ado, we'll just let folks trickle in. Thank you, everyone who joined on time, ready to go. Uh, and uh, I won't stand in the way of the goodness that's going to happen tonight. So uh, my name is Kenny Turner. I'm with an organization called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm joined uh, as well. You'll see uh, in our chat, uh, Antonio, Ant uh, Antonio Castro, uh, she will be assisting in the chat. And uh, so you'll see her name and uh, things pop up. Um, so please, please, um, please do engage. Uh, this is a very engaging opportunity. Uh, this is an opportunity to stay as engaged. Uh, and uh, just want to give Nicolette College a big, big welcome and thank you. They're not able to join us on on the screen right now, but uh, um, but I do see Tony in the uh, as an attendee. So hello, Tony. Uh, Nicolette College has made this possible in partnership with Nifty and the SBA uh, and GRID. So tonight is uh, two, uh, the second of six workshops or webinars that we'll be doing throughout the spring. And we encourage you to, to join all of them. We'll put the uh, link in the chat if you're not aware of how to register for all of the workshops. This is number two. Uh, and we started it off uh, real strong. <laughs> so uh, last time, and um, it's going to keep going. So uh, I just want to encourage you all to to uh, plug in, uh, share it out, get this out to your um, to your network. Uh, you definitely won't be disappointed with the subjects we'll be talking about. Uh, and we're excited about the subject matter coming up tonight. So uh, without further ado, though, I want to introduce uh, Brad. Brad is the founder of South Sitecast. And he kicked it off last time talking about AI and how AI uh, infiltrates and impacts your small business. Um, uh, and tonight we're going to do something uh, on, <laughs> on something a little bit different, but somewhat familiar, but also a lot to learn, a lot to learn. So Brad has a really interesting strategy uh, and approach to his uh, workshop. So Brad, without further ado, I want to introduce yourself. Please feel free to fill in any information that I might have missed in your intro so folks know who you are. Uh, but thank you again. Can we give a warm round of applause and welcome to Brad? Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, so the last uh, webinar, I went through a lot of interesting technology. Uh, we're going to see some similar patterns here because a lot of that technology has infiltrated the web world as well. Um, two weeks ago, it was 
just kind of a general overview of AI. Uh, but now we're getting into more of the specifics in terms of building a web presence, how to monetize it, and uh, just sprinkling in AI throughout this whole process because there's no reason not to use AI at this point. And it's, it's really, really quite fascinating. So the cool thing about this one versus the last one is I actually have a presentation this time because the last event, uh, about half of the stuff I talked about last time was, was brand new that week. It's the AI world's just moving so fast that there really wasn't any time to even do a, a PowerPoint or anything. The thing that we're going to be talking about tonight is something I've been talking about for probably a decade or so. The overall concept has not changed. The, the implementation, the tools, the platforms, all of that has changed many, many times, but the concepts stay the same. And it, it's been the same for 20 years. I've been teaching this probably for probably 12 years now, this, this overall concept. Uh, but without further ado, I'm gonna hop in. Um, I am gonna share my screen. And so how we're going to do this is I'm going to share my screen and it'll be twofold here. So I'm, I have the presentation and then we're going to hop over into a browser as well. But it's just a little bit easier to, to look at the at the, the PowerPoint instead of, you know, the, the browser for the most part. One question I have, do you see me still like my physical body? Like, is there a camera as well? Yes, I can see. Okay, you. cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just wanted to <laughs> wanted to make sure that yeah. um, I get kind of animated sometimes and it uh, I just curious. All right. So th this whole presentation is, like I've said, has changed many times. The title has changed. Even the the core content has changed, but the concept has not. And it's all about building trust. And the way to do that is, is pretty exciting now that we have, have AI. So when we first came up with this, this, uh, this event, I hadn't really thought about sprinkling in AI just yet. Um, so it wasn't called supercharge your website with AI. It was just kind of like monetizing your website. Um, it's the same concept. I just have a few different things that we can use AI for as well. So it's pretty exciting. All right. So to get into it, uh, oh, there we go. Um, all right. So a little background on myself. Uh, I built my first website for, uh, uh, I guess, like a, comp a, a professional website when I was 12 years old. It was in 1998. And I was hanging out in the, the computer lab. And someone wanted to sell. I, I live on a Native American reservation. And there's these things called decoys that, that the, the, our, our ancestors used when fishing. And he wanted to sell, he made those and he wanted to sell them online. And this was 1998. And I've been building websites ever since then. So he came to me, we had to actually take photos of the, the decoys, get them developed, you know, film, and then scan them back in, then have like a thing that you could send in a, a check and all this stuff. The world has evolved a ton since then. And so I've seen all of the transitions from, you know, the ways that websites used to be to how they are now. Uh, you know, I was doing this before social media. I, I've made a, a pretty good career out of building websites for companies. And so I, I just have a lot of experience and a lot of, I, I guess you could say, successes under my belt in terms of building businesses online uh, from everything from mom and pops to large organizations. Uh, I've worked with with them all at this point. So, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm super passionate about cutting edge technology because the thing is, is like, it's so exciting to be on the cutting edge because you're, there's always something new to learn. There's always just, it's just fun to be around. So a lot of the stuff I may introduce you to, you might have never heard of, or if you're, you know, super into it like me, you, you might have, but we'll, I guess we'll find out. So Getting into it, the whole concept that you're going to learn tonight is a framework called AWARE. And so AWARE stands for Attract, Welcome, Add Value, Retain, and Engage. And we're going to get into all of those. But essentially what it does is it's a, a way to structure your mindset, your marketing, your 
just all of your, your material, your content, everything around a way that continually builds trust with your audience. You uh, find them, you, uh, you, know, you build trust, and then eventually they're gonna give you money. And so I'll just go through just the overview here. So basically the AWARE method stands for attract, which is driving traffic to your website. And then once they're on the website, you welcome them you know, with a, a, an appealing first impression. And then once they have liked what they see on the website, you give them something of value, which will then get them into becoming more of a fan than anything. And then once they're a fan, you have to do certain things that retain them as a fan. And then after that, you engage them. So that's where it, and then once you engage, then hopefully it starts the whole circle back again, where they were coming back to the website and it's, it's just like a, a circle of life basically. And we're going to go through all five of these. Um, I've given this in, uh, three day workshops. I've given this in 30 minute classes. This is 90 minutes. So I'm going to try to go somewhat quick. Again, this will all be recorded. So if you miss something, you know, you'll, you'll have access to the recording later and, you know, just feel free to check that out or, you know, what, it, however you think best. Um, but so getting into it, the key benefits of the AWARE framework, and a lot of this is you can just read, but I'll go over the, the highlights. So the, the key is, is the more website vis visitors you have, the better, obviously. However, that isn't the full thing. So if you get more visitors, they also need to do what you want them to do. So you have to provide them a better user experience. So think about this example. If you had a thousand people go to your website, and 10 of them did what you want them to do versus you had 100 people, which is you know, a lot less people go to your website. If you had 100 people go to your website, but 20 of them did what you want them to do, would you rather have the 1,000 down to 10 or the 100 down to 20? So you know, that starts to, I would personally would want the 100 that does 20 versus the 1,000 that does 10. And the way that you do that is through this whole process. And it's all, the overall concept is called conversion rate optimization. And so it's, it's about getting more website visitors, but providing them a better user experience that converts them. And that will turn them into loyal customers and ultimately create a stronger community for your brand. Um, all right, so the goal for this um, webinar is going to be hopefully by the end of it, you're going to have better traffic generation. You're going to boost your conversions. You're going to have a lot of fun ways, thanks to AI, of how to create content. And then you're also going to have a little bit of idea of how to build a community. So those are in general, the, the presentation outcomes that we're, we're hoping for here. So with that, um, if there's any questions before I hop into this framework, that was kind of like the overall, just what to expect. So does anyone have any thoughts? And before, I guess before that, how we'll do it is Kenny can ask me uh, if throughout this whole thing, feel free to ask questions. Um, anytime I transition between a slide or go to my browser or something like that, Kenny can just interject and ask the questions at that time. So that's so, good. You, yep. you do have one question, Brad, which is... Okay uh where are you from from <laughs> so oh, you... <laughs> i'm from the internet uh no so uh i actually grew up in northern wisconsin uh in lack of flambeau i've been all over the u.s i've i've bounced around in my 20s around different startup hubs i found myself out west for a long time and now i'm back in the north woods with my wife and um lovely little girl so we are um, battling snow and all sorts of fun, fun weather right now. Can't wait for spring to start. But, um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff that we do is just like this. It's, it's all internet based. I, we have a lot of customers locally as well. Uh, but we do do a lot of stuff virtually. So hopefully that answers your, your question. All right. 
So we're going to hop into it because I got a lot to go over and, um, and oh yeah, so, so I added this slide. So this is one of the main things that I've always heard when I give this presentation, which the, if you enact this whole framework, you're going to do extremely well. But I totally understand that as an entrepreneur or, you know, uh, an overworked executive or, you know, whatever your role is, there's just never enough time in the day to do a lot of these strategies. However, the, the, the internet gods have gifted us the most amazing content generation tools ever. And it's really amazing. So there's no more excuses to do a lot of this stuff. You can have AI create your content. You can have it do your emails. You can have you know chat bots. There's all sorts of stuff. I'll get into, or I'll try to remember to get into, or I'll just talk about it right now. So having AI create content for you is kind of a slippery slope though, because if you don't do it in, a, in the right way, which you'll have to just revisit my, my presentation uh, from this, the, the previous webinar, but if you don't structure it in a way where, if you, if you were at my last presentation, I had a super generic prompt and then I had a really elaborate prompt. The generic prompt created generic outcomes. The elaborate prompt created a really nice outcome. And so if you just go to something like ChatGPT or one of these different tools and type, write me a blog post about fitness, it's going to be so generic and nobody's going to read it. It's, and that's, the world is just going to get over just, there's just going to be so much content going forward. There already is so much content. I remember like, it was probably at least 10 years ago or even more, like super long ago, I think it was Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of, of Google at the time, he had said that there was more content being created like almost on a daily basis. I forget that it was so long ago, but it was like, it was created so like almost on a daily basis, there was more content being created than ever being created in human history, like on a daily basis. And now imagine with all this AI and chat stuff, it's just, there's going to be so much content and the ability to get the signal through the noise is going to be harder than ever. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's going to be very, very hard to get your message out there using all of this stuff. So if you just blindly use AI tools, it's not going to, at first it might seem cool where it's like, oh, I can create a blog post. But then you have to think about everyone else in your competition. If they're not doing it yet in the next six months, they're going to be doing the same thing. So you still got to sprinkle in personality, you got to put in, you know, personal stories, you got to put in all sorts of additional um, effort into it. However, there's still the, the concept of writer's block is basically gone, though, because you can create something that then you edit. Because that's, I think that's the hardest part about creating content and creating a website and creating just like an online presence is you just stare at a blank screen. And you're like, I don't know what to write about. Well, at least for now, we have the ability to create something, and then you can then put in your own, your own spice into, into it. So no more excuses. All right. So the goals of all of everything that I ever teach to everybody ever is that your website and these strategies you, are three things. So one is you get more awareness. You have to continually put your brand out there. And then in turn, you're going to get more customers. And the number one goal is more revenue. That's, there's a really great book that is probably dated by now, but it's, it's kind of timeless. Uh, it's called The Goal by Eli Goldratt. If you have yet to read that, uh, um, it's, it's amazing. And it talks about that every business, like everything that a business does, its main function its main goal is to make revenue. Everything that it does is for that goal. So, you know, if, if you're doing certain tactics that, that, you know, aren't progressing that and there is no clear roadmap, you know, we all get caught in that where we're doing something and there's like, oh, I, I don't know if this is going to work out. But at the end of the end of the day, you really want to make sure that all of this stuff is creating more awareness, in turn, creating more customers and in turn, creating more, more revenue. All right, so the first A, attract, has three main buckets to it. So the goal 
of the attract phase is to bring potential customers to your website. It's probably pretty obvious. And the three ways that are the most, uh, there, there's a ton of ways, you know, you can even do like something on the radio or whatever. Like there's a ton of ways to bring people to the website, but the main ways is search, social and ads. Search is my favorite because it doesn't, Technically, you know, like, I don't know, technically it doesn't cost anything because once you create something that ranks well for that keyword, it's, it's going to show up and people are going to come to your website and it's going to do it for as long as it still ranks. Social is my second favorite. This is ranked in my, from most favorite to least favorite. Second favorite is social. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of social. Just, I don't know. It's, I, I, I don't like social media, but I get that there's a place for it, for brands to have a social presence. And the, the thing I don't like about it is that it's uh, what was ephemeral, you know, like you type something, if you tweet something out, yeah, someone sees it for maybe two hours, or if it gets retweeted a day or something like that. But for the most part, you put something out there and after a day or a week, no one's ever going to see that ever again, <laughs> like ever. So it's, it's just like this hamster wheel that you're constantly trying to like do stuff with in comparison to search where you spend a good time making a really nice website landing page. That thing lives there. And like I still have articles that I wrote probably 15 years ago at this point that still bring in traffic. And there's stuff that I wrote on Facebook back when I was still in college that, you know, I don't even know where that is at that point, you know? And so it's like, like there's, it's so much, so much better to do search. And then the third, I guess you could also go in reverse of like how easy it is to get people to the website. So ads are my least favorite because it costs money, but they're also the easiest way to bring people to a website because it's instantaneous. You can have something show up on a, a, new, a Facebook feed you could have it show up in a search result. It's the easiest way to get targeted traffic to your website. However, it's also the most expensive. So with, with search, you know, there's a lot of upfront costs. Social, there's a lot of ongoing costs. And ads is, is every single person that comes to your website is going to cost you money. So, you know, so take that for what it, what it is. Um, and let me just, um, I'm wondering if, uh, let's see, uh, I might do, I guess I'll wait on doing examples. I'll just go through this and then I'll, I'll hop into examples. So let's go to the next, all right, I guess, is there any questions before um, we good? Not at the moment, but if anybody okay. has like a, you know, just prepare. I just want to encourage the the uh, the listeners. If you have a website example or something for Brad to, as he's going through these principles, maybe something you've tried and uh, want to get his perspective on as he's going through these key points. Uh, prepare those questions for sure. So, thanks, Brad. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So, if anybody, so this is what I normally do uh, in my in person workshops. Is we'll actually, if anybody has a website that. You know, if you are um, bold enough, we I can go to it and and critique it a little bit. This attract phase is is super. You know, uh, it's common, so it's not much that I need to talk about. It's the other ones that you know we're really getting into the meat of it. But I saw some questions rolling then, so yeah, we can answer them now. They just popped up from Chris Argo. What's up, Chris? How are you? Uh, and he dropped his and he dropped his website for you to check nice. out as well okay. on there. So uh, You're paid brave. ads, yes, right. yes, uh, paid ads. Uh, what's a safe first place to try this uh, to try this out for paid ads? What would you suggest? That's per That's a great question, and I love that. Yes, that. So it really depends on your audience. Long story short whatever you are trying to sell or trying to build your name or whatever, you know, it kind of makes sense to wherever that is. So if you're a B2B, meaning that you sell to other businesses, something like LinkedIn is going to probably be, you know, a good first step or Google search, something where other business people are at. Like 
if you're B2B and advertising on Pinterest, you know, that might not be the best scenario. But if you're B2C, like selling to consumers, Pinterest or Facebook, those might be good first options. So it's really just kind of looking where your best audience is and where you want to get in front of them. And that would be where I would put the ads. Um, and then, yeah, so it's it's really a case-by-case -case basis, but that was a, that was a great question. Uh, and then you have the, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to your website um, when we do this next one. And uh, let me see. All right, so the... So that's the attraction phase and that's, there's books on it. There's all sorts of stuff. Now we're getting into the website. So you've now got the traffic coming to your website. This is where it really starts to, to be important. And I'll just, I guess I'll just read this. You want to create a positive experience for website, build, for website visitors. Um, but I use a, uh, an old sales technique as an example for this. So back in the day, encyclopedia salespeople, <coughs> sorry, one second. And so encyclopedia salespeople would go door to door and sell encyclopedias. And, you know, that kind of seems foreign today because we don't, you know, we would never answer the door, but they used to do that. And how they would do this, it was pretty fascinating. So the, the person would kind of scope out the yard and they would see like toys in the yard and they would have a good understanding of what's going on in the, with that household. So they'd come up to the, to the house, they'd knock on the door and say, is this your house? Like once they answer, is this your house? And the chance of them not saying yes is so slim because like they just answered the door. So they ask a question that is a super, super way, easy way to get them to say yes. And then they'll follow up with another question of, do you have kids? And of course the answer is yes. They already know, they saw the toys, they saw all of that. So by getting them to say yes again, now all of a sudden they've said yes twice. And then they'll ask more uh, relatively softball questions to get them to say yes. So it's like, do you want your kids to be smarter? Like what parent doesn't want their kids to be smarter? So they've now said yes three times. And then they'll keep asking certain questions that compel them to say yes. And after a certain point, they've said yes so many times that it's like physically impossible for them to say no. And all of a sudden they have a set of encyclopedias on the shelf. And so that process worked incredibly well for door-to-door -door salespeople. And it works incredibly well now if you use it as an analogy. And so the analogy would be is, and I'm going to, uh, let me see if I can hop over to this. Um, and if I think this, this zoom thing is always perfectly in the way. Okay. So I'm going to use this as an example. So we, uh, we built this website for this resort a few years ago, and it was incredibly, um, it was just overwhelming how well this worked. And it's all, this is a good way to show the yes statement. So you get to the website. However, that traffic comes, you know, whether it's a chamber of commerce, some sort of travel agency, um, search, social, however, an ad, you know, however they get to this site, they're now on the site. And what you want them to do is say, wow. And by having them say, wow, that's the first yes. And it doesn't necessarily need to be anything fancy or flashy or anything. It just needs to get them to say, I want to not leave this website right away. And if they leave the website right away, that's a bounce. And that's, you don't want those. And I guess on a side note, a bounce is anything that's, it depends on the analytic program, but it's like 10 to 15 seconds on the site. If they're, if they leave before that, it's a bounce. And so you don't want bounces, because, especially if you're paying for the ad or, you know, you went through a bunch of hoops to get them to come to the site. If they bounce out right away and don't even give you a chance a site or a, don't even get, give your site a shot. It's you're, you're just kind of, you know, you're already, you're already dead in the water, um, pun intended with this water. All right. So this here is the first wow. And it's like, okay, I at least want to know more because if I'm looking for a resort to stay at in Minocqua, which is the town near us, I'm going to at least want to look a little bit further into this. 
And so by, so by not bouncing, they're saying yes. And then by scrolling, they're saying yes. So you want to get them to scroll. And there's been a lot of studies done that people, uh, these are somewhat old studies too. I haven't seen like any new research. I have to imagine that it's even more, but it was like the vast majority of people instantly start scrolling when they get to a website because it's just a habit. And so as you go through a website, you want them to continually say yes. And so here, you know, we have, we're putting the best foot forward in terms of their, um, their resort. They have this really iconic and historic uh, boathouse that anybody that's been to Manaqua probably knows about it. So they see that and they, okay, they, they might remember that. So that's another yes. And then, you know, they're going through and saying yes again. And then all of a sudden, here's a quote that or a testimonial from a recent guest. And it has, you know, a fun, it shows the resort in the background. There's another yes. And they keep going, okay, now here's some images. Uh, you know, I want to see this bird. I want to be in this kayak. You know, I want to have my kid jump on my back like this. Like all of those are yeses. And as those yeses happen, it's making it harder for them to leave at least until they, you know, they, you know, find something that really, really turns them away. But, you know, all of this is designed to say yes. Now you get into it where now they're much more likely to engage in the site. So now here's the amenities, here's the lodging options, here's the things to do, and you know, here's a call to action. This is purely for SEO in terms of this is on every page. So just like, you know, Minaqua, um, Lakefront Resort, uh, there's, you know, just all sorts of like keywords in here, um, family, like, you know, it's just, just really helpful for SEO. And then the call calls to action in terms of contacting them, and then you know, more options here, uh, a huge call to action, and then, you know, the, a fun little water thing. So, so this concept here is something that continually gets them to say yes over and over and over again. And the site that they had prior to this was, it looked no different than any other resort site that you've ever been on. It just didn't perform well because there was too much going on. You didn't know at any given time what what to do and people would just leave. Like they didn't know how to book. They didn't have, they just didn't have information that they wanted to know where this you're only presenting them a little bit at, at a time. All right. So we're going to use this site throughout the, the presentation here to go over a lot of these concepts, but let me just remember. Um, yeah. So let's do this and then we'll hop into that. Um, the, let's see, what was the website? Credible coverage. Okay. Yeah. Um, gotta go back. Don't look. <laughs> there we go. Uh, okay. So building trust. I, I kind of touched on it, but a lot of that is, is making sure that you seem credible. You know how many websites I go to that just instantly kind of give you like a wrong vibe of it's like, Oh, I don't know if these are legit. Like, you know, what's going on here. I, I don't understand you really want to just boost your credibility as much as humanly possible. And so like testimonials, uh, other ways to do that. Like if it wasn't a resort, if you're like, a, um, you know, maybe you have partnership logos or you have, um, you know, in integrations or just, just anything that gives like that third party proof. And so testimonials are, are really big. And I love testimonials because uh, it's, it just, says like, you know, someone else has done business with you and that they enjoyed the process. So, so just super important. Um, all right. So let's go over to here and all right, Chris, we're going to, we're going to go to your site and let's see what, what comes up here. Um, cool. All right. So Chris runs, I'm assuming he runs a website or owns the company or something for crediblecoverage.com. And at first glance, this is goes along with what we were talking about, where I at least would like to see more. It doesn't make me want to leave. So that's that's a good first step. Uh, this widget didn't load probably because I'm using the Brave browser. I blocked like pretty much everything. Um, there is actually kind of a lot of widgets here. So um, I'll go over the good things and that'll be a little little harsh as well. So this is, let's see. 
so here's here's kind of building the trust. It's not per se of a testimonial, but it at least shows that they work with other uh, organizations. So that's great. That that's perfect. Um, check out Medicare 101. I'm assuming that's like a course or a blog post or a video. That's awesome because that's going to build more trust. Uh, signing up for newsletter, that's going to be great. That's going to be our next, next point here. And then we get down to some calls to action and social. So over, overall, uh, I really like it. Um, I would say, so let me, uh, overall, I, I would say I like it. Let me just go over the points that may be things that may cause confusion. Is So one thing is that there's an overall concept of the paradox of choice. And so when you're given too many options at any given time, you tend to not take any of those options. And so I, and I, I would have to see the analytics and the, like the click patterns to really for certain, you know, know that this would work or not. But like, I feel like there's too many things going on, especially with like, you know, there's the nav bar. Um, I, if it was me, I would simplify it a little bit. And, you know, having a lot of this stuff kind of, um, you know, just busies it up a little bit, but maybe it works. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to see without the analytics. At first glance, I think that there's too many calls to action because, you know, it's, it's hard to, hard to tell, but it might work. Who knows? Um, so, so overall, I think, think you did really good, Chris. Um, I like it. Uh, and I'll hop back into it if we get to the other points. Um, so let me go over to here and any questions or comments or anything before I go to the next. No new questions popped up, but I'd love to, again, if uh, for those listening, if you have a question for Brad, please, uh, please feel free uh, to ask a question uh, in the question feature. Um, but no new questions as of, as of this point. Okay, perfect. All right, so in the aware, so it's A, W, A. Um, the A is the add value. And this is, each one of these is more important in terms of creating a lifelong customer versus a transactional customer. So obviously a transactional customer is gonna be someone that goes to your site, buys something, or you know maybe reads a blog post, or you know does one thing, and then you never see him again. That is, while that isn't the end of the world, you know, like if they've shared your post or something, they did something that's great. But if you don't get them into your ecosystem, you're going to just have to start back with the A, the other A again. So where you're, you're now attracting more. And if you're doing it through ads or something that's paid or, you know, a lot of different effort, it just makes life so much harder versus getting them into this ecosystem. And so I put in here three different options or like ideas, I guess, for ways to add value. And as you saw in Chris's, it, it kind of seemed like that's what he was doing with the, the Medicare, uh, Medicare 101. The three that are, and I'll get into this with the AI, is lead magnets, content, and just different like offers. So that could be discounts or promotions, early access to stuff. Um, but the the one that applies pretty much across the map are lead magnets. And if you haven't heard of that term, you definitely need to, to Google it and research it. Lead magnets have been around for a long time and they're, they've been around for a long time because they work. And that, an example of that could be like an ebook or you know if you have some sort of like bold claim, you could create a white paper around that, that you know, your thought process or why your business, it, it could be like a manifesto of like why you believe a certain thing. Um, or the lead magnet could just be like a, I guess like a demo or a, a free trial or something along those lines too. But my favorite is the ebook. And I'll show you uh, <laughs> with the rise of AI, ebooks are incredibly simple to make now. You still have to go through the effort um, however, let me, I'm, I'm going to open up a uh, chat. Um, let's see. So actually I'm going to, this might be a little different than what you're used to. 
but I'm going to just use this because it's a little bit easier to, to watch. So let's say, so you are an ebook creator. Um, and then this is just way easier to show than instead of ChatGPT. It's the same concept, but okay. So if you wanted to, like, let's say, write an ebook for, here, we'll do that for, for this one. So let's see. So you are on, um, let's do it for ChatGPT. It's, this is easier. Okay, so let's do, I'll do it with four. Um, so if you missed my uh, one last time, our webinar last time, if you have GP, chat GPT plus, you get access to GPT-4. Um, you only get, uh, you're severely limited, but this will be this will be pretty easy to just show you. You would want to expand this greatly, but let's just say you want to have, um, let's see, I would like to create an ebook for um, my website as a lead magnet. Draft an outline for um, the topic of Medicare from a, um, I'll just do that. We don't need to go super in depth. All right, so if I type this in, this is gonna blow your mind. So that's why there's no more excuses. Ebooks are a great use for um, ChatGPT because unlike when it's on your website, there might be like Google and Bing and all that, search is changing. And so any AI generated content from a, a search standpoint, who knows, it's kind of up in the air of what's gonna go on. And so all of a sudden, there's no more excuse for, for writer's block. There's a full outline for an ebook that you now can create. So if you're a subject, uh, subject expert on, or a subject matter expert on a topic, you can just do what I just did and you can all of a sudden have a complete outline where now you don't have, have writer's block. And you're able to then go through and as you see, it's pretty impressive. Like I'm, I don't know much about Medicare, but you know, this, it seems pretty good where you can now go in and type in your, the age and disability requirements or citizenship. So this is a pretty awesome way to create a lead magnet and lead magnets work. They're, they're amazing because people will want to kind of dip their toes into your, into your brand. So here's an outline. So you could do that, um, but what's really fun, and you know, if you watch any videos on YouTube about AI or something like this, this is a super common example. So this isn't like anything revolutionary here, like you know, creating an outline, and then what you would do is then you would just go in and say, expand on chapter one. You click that, and then all of a sudden, now you're getting into uh, a more elaborate, um, outline that then you can put in your original thoughts. So as you notice, I'm not saying to just write it because if it just writ wrote it, it's going to be generic. It might even be false. You've got to really be careful because a lot of this stuff, like one thing, this was trained up to 2021. So that's, you know, you got to be maybe new laws are out there about Medicare or something like that. Like you got to really be careful in terms of what information it's talking about. But then also, if it's super generic, that it was just written by some AI bot, it's going to then, well, well, one, it's not going to be engaging to read. It's not going to, it may even do like, um, it may do more harm than good if you're just creating some generic thing that they've downloaded and they're like, this is, you know, this is useless. They're just going to leave. But if you can take this outline and now go through and write it, you know, maybe you can use it, um, ChatGPT to like, you know, expand on this a little bit further, but this is probably as far as I'd go with it in terms of this example of, of a lead magnet. So, so that's the lead magnets are the best, but ultimately what, what we want to do as I have here is you want to convert the website visitor into an email subscriber. 
yes, it's great for them to follow you on Facebook and follow you on Twitter and you know do all those other platforms. However, there's a few flaws to that. So one is those like, where did Friendster go? Where did MySpace go? You know, like th these platforms aren't around forever. So that's, you know, the major one. And then as you're seeing, while I would hope that most of you aren't controversial, you've seen that when you have a specific viewpoint, these tech platforms can with one button delete your whole account. And having that liability is scary. So if you build up, so like for instance, I know of uh, this one company that a few years back, they were in like kind of like a gray area of an industry and Facebook changed the rules of how Facebook pages could be in that gray industry. And they had like 300,000 followers and Facebook deleted them with one button and they were gone. And so they put all of this effort years into building 300,000 followers and they, they could not be on Facebook anymore because of one policy shift. And it, personally, I think that, you know, that gray areas shouldn't exist. Like they should still be on it, but you know, it's, it's up to that company to decide. So with all that said, the reason you want to be into email is that once you have their email, there's nobody saying that you can't send them something. Yes, if you got on a spam list or you did you know, like shady stuff, it still is probably hard to reach them. But at the very least, no one can delete you. You know, you really gotta like, it's just such a better, better overall, uh, it's more secure, I guess, in terms of, of the email's not gonna go away. There, it's hard to, as long as you play by the rules, you're not going to end up on a spam list. Like, you know, it's, it's, you're, you'll be fine if you play by the rules. So when was it like mid nineties, email became a thing and email we're almost 30 years later and email is still a thing. And so if that's the case, like it's been around, it's tried and true. So it's, you know, it's, it's here to stay. So my personal recommendation is to capture emails and the key with all of this is that whether it's a lead magnet, uh, high quality content, uh, different offers, whatever, free trial, it all is designed to capture their email. And then once you capture it, then you know I'll talk about that next. But once you capture their email, that's great. So uh, the lead magnet one is obvious because if, if they're gonna download an ebook, you don't just give them a link to the PDF you say, put in your email, we'll email you the PDF or something like that. We'll email you the, the, the white paper or whatever it may be. But however that is, is you wanna email them, it's gotta have a payoff for them to put in their email. So that's kind of the lead magnet side of things. The quality content, if someone finds your content, and this is how I did it back in the day, I grew a fairly big email list and a big following back when this, you know, a decade ago um, around personal productivity and uh, peak performance and things like that, uh, digital nomad stuff. Uh, I would create articles and then right at the bottom of the article, I would say, if you like this and you want more, put in your email and we'll send you, send you more or, you know, whatever your call to action would be. But it was designed in a way where if they've read all the way down your article or watched your video or you know listen to your podcast or whatever it is, if you can say, we will send you the next one in your email, we're not gonna do anything with your, e we're not gonna spell, sell your email, we're not gonna spam it, you know, we're just gonna send you quality information going forward, put in your email to stay in the loop. That's gonna work incredibly well. Then the other side of it are the offers and that's more for like the e-commerce side. So it's kind of, I have mixed opinions on this where you'll go to like a Shopify store and it'll pop up and it'll say like, put in your email and get 10% off or something. That's great. And that's kind of what I'm talking about, but it's a slippery slope because if you put in your email and, or if, if you get that and are expecting 10%, in your mind, you might be like, well, maybe I could get 15% or maybe I should refresh or I'll try later and I'll get 20%. Or if they've used that 
then the next time they go to the website and they don't get the 10% and they have to pull, pay full price, you're now in their mind, a discount uh, e-commerce store. And so they might never pay full price ever again for any of your stuff. So like you look at how Apple, for instance, the when have you ever seen, unless it's in like Best Buy or something, when have you ever seen a sale at Apple? You know, like the, the AirPods, when they were brand new and the AirPods right now are basically the same price. They hit, like they may have like a Black Friday thing or something, but for the vast majority of time, there is never any discounts. And so, you know, you just want to tread lightly with that. And that's, that's kind of neither here nor there. All right. So any questions before I go to the next one? Yes, we do. We have another question from Chris. Yeah. Um, Chris says, where can someone go to learn more about playing by the rules with email marketing? Um, you know, I would, I'll, I'll show you a modern way to do it. I would ask ChatGPT. Let's do, um, I, I'm in ChatGPT like all day, every day. Uh, right. Bing, actually <laughs> Bing is, Bing has incorporated into it. So that might actually be probably a better one, uh, but we'll just stick with ChatGPT. Uh, give me a brief overview of how to get my emails um, uh, opened and out of spam filters. All right, so if you type in something like that, so I'm doing this in ChatGPT just to like, you know, keep, keep your mind open that you don't need to use Google anymore. Uh, so yeah, this is actually great. <laughs> so yeah, so one, like there's different things that you can do in the DNS. So the SBF is really important. There's DKIM and the DMARC. Those are kind of annoying to be honest, but if you really want your emails to be, to have a huge deliverable, you want to do those as well. And you just have to Google that. I'm not going to get into it, but you want to do that. And then also, <laughs> yeah, this is pretty good. So you would want to use, like, you wouldn't just like send out a bunch through, like I've seen where they put BCC and they'll just like send a ton through BCC. That's like the worst way to do it. Or just use some like free email marketing.com or something, you know, whatever those platforms are, those are not going to be good. Um, use something good. Like, like I haven't really used it, but HubSpot, I've heard a lot of good things. All of ours, we code using uh either uh it's smtp it's sendgrid if you're if you're integrating into an app sendgrid is really great because it's owned by twilio um there's different mailchimp is the 800 pound gorilla you know so just you know pick them wisely pardot is pretty good that's through salesforce there's all sorts of them and then there's a, there's a ton of other ones here but that's yeah you got to have an unsubscribe link you got to make sure that, um, yeah, don't use scammy words like free or, you know, open me with a bunch of emojis or something like that. You, know, you just want to like make it seem like a legit email and you're probably pretty good. Um, but yeah, so I would, I would go into ChatGPT and ask, ask ChatGPT that question. So, all right. So I'm going to go into the next phase because uh, we are, yeah, we got, we got time. All right. So we got the next one of aware. So there's uh, the A W A R is retain. And so retain is going to be to keep your audience engaged and drive them back to your website. And the more that you retain that audience, like I had mentioned earlier, if you keep a customer, it's so much cheaper than trying to find a new customer. Cause when you're trying to constantly find new customers and have some sort of transactional thing going on, it's just so hard because if you're doing ads, you got to pay for them. Or, you know, if you're doing social media, you got to constantly, it's just, just this hamster wheel that you don't need to go through. You should always be doing it, but you shouldn't need to constantly be trying to find new uh, audience members, I guess. You would want to try to keep your audience. And so a few different ways to do that is through, one is that consistent communication. Whatever your channel is, like I was saying, I love email, but you know, whatever, Facebook, Twitter, how, wherever your audience lives, you want to keep that communication up. You want to stay consistent. And when I say consistent, you want to stay within your niche. So I, I see a lot of times where like someone will have a Twitter account 
And sometimes they'll be posting about their dog and then they'll be posting about the weather. And, you know, it's just like, it's all over the map where if someone's following you, they should be following you for a very specific thing. And so that's really important. Personalization is another one where in all the modern, I'm just going to go to the emails but for the most part for here, here and out. So personalization, you can do things where you can build a list in a way where you learn more about them. So let, let's say like right away, you should ask for their, their first name. You probably don't need to ask for their full name, or maybe you don't even ask for their, their first name. But if you ask at least for their first name, they're probably going to give it to you. Don't ask for the last name because then it's like, you know, what are you going to do with my information? But if it's just like Bob and their email, like they're probably going to give that. Or the, if they don't want to give their first name, they'll put B or something, you know. So first name is not terrible to ask for. And the reason for that is then all of the emails going forward, instead of saying, hello, comma, you can say, hello, first name. Or, you know, you can, you can personalize those messages. And for the vast, vast majority of people, they're going to appreciate that personalization. People like me, I know that they're just, you know, some sort of thing, but like, if it's, if it's an average person, average customer, they're going to be like, oh, wow, they're either sending this personally to me or, you know, that they really, they just like, people like to see their names. What's really cool is that's kind of the first step. Because what you can then also do is you can have them, uh, like say they attended a webinar and now you know they like a certain topic or so now you can like flag them and tag them in certain ways where then all of a sudden now you're sending them specific emails of like, hey, remember the webinar we did three months ago? We actually have this coming up that you might like. And there, that, that is so much better in terms of building that audience Versus like sending out a generic thing like, hey, we have a webinar coming up, you know, and where you have that data, why not use it? So the more that you can personalize those messages and get really creative with it. So like, you know, you don't want to get creepy with the data that, you know, you don't want to be like, like, you know, I know that you bought this thing and you live here and, all, you know, like you don't want to like creep them out. But if it's just like subtle things that is, it gets them to realize that, you have a relationship with them, you know, that's, it's really helpful. And then there is also in most email platforms, uh, you are able to, to, I would say almost all of them, you'd be able to see who opens, who clicks on a link, um, who has blocked it. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that you can learn from the analytics. And the whole goal with that is if someone say like, for three months or six months, they haven't opened a single email, you know, maybe you need to try something else. You can re-engage them in a different way. Or if they haven't opened in a year, just delete them because there's the way that, this goes back to Chris's question. Um, so the way that spam filters and all these new email platforms work is that, like think of Google. If you send out a broadcast and it goes to a thousand different Google users, Google knows, or Gmail, Google knows that those thousand all got that broadcast. And somewhere in their system, if only 10 people open that, that's going to reflect poorly on you, actually, because they'll be like, okay, well, a thousand people got this, but only 10 people opened it. None of those people probably like it. So that's just going to like go in some sort of algorithm where maybe you end up not being shown in the priority list or you get sent to the promotions tab or something like that. And so I, by pruning your list, you also get to make sure that your emails are, are the most deliverable. Um, let's see. So to summarize all of that, going back to AI and the ways to do it in a much more scalable fashion is the old way of doing emails was doing a newsletter. So every two weeks or every month, you would write all this stuff about your business and you'd send it out. And then next month you do the exact same thing. And it was just this, again, this hamster wheel of content creation. However, think about this scenario where if someone signed up, let's say you spent a day, like a full day on a newsletter and you send it out and then 10 people signed up for your email list the next day, not a single person of those 10 people get to see 
what you just spent a day on where the alternative to that is called drip marketing. And that's, it's relative to when they sign up. So instead of doing it where it's like every month on a Tuesday, I'm going to send this out. Instead, based on when they sign up, that's when they get certain emails. So if they sign up, whether it's tomorrow or next year, they get the same welcome email. And then seven days later, or in a perfect world here would be the format, would be they get the welcome email right away. And then maybe a day or two later, they get like a helpful email. And then three days later, they get another email. And then you start spreading it out a little bit more where seven days later, they get another email and then seven days and then 14 days. And then maybe then it's every 14 days or something or however you want to do it. But the beauty of it is everybody gets the same emails relative to when they signed up. So if you think about it, if you spent an hour or a full day on that newsletter where nobody in the future is ever going to see that versus spend an hour, I keep saying an hour, full day on the drip campaign, everybody's going to say, see that. And so where I'm going at with an hour is anything that was potentially a day should be an hour at this point. So let's, let's just look at this. So if we do chat GPT, um, Chris put his email in, so I'm going to give him all these uh, free, free help. So um, draft. And again, you would want to watch my other presentation or watch YouTube or something, look in a prompt design, prompt engineering, because you really need to have a better one than what I'm showing you, because this is just going to be pretty generic draft and outline for a let's say um, 10 part series, um, email series around Medicare. All right, so, so instead of the newsletter, so check this out. So now it's drafting an outline for a 10 part email series around Medicare. And so all of a sudden, when they sign up, they now get, this is email one, and um, we're using GPT-4, so it's kind of slow, but um, email two, that might, and then you can go in and schedule this in MailChimp or ConvertKit or, you know, whatever your program of HubSpot, whatever, they should all have drip marketing. And if they don't have drip marketing, um, I would find someone else because <laughs> this, this is so much easier. It's, you want to scale your time. You don't want to, you want to not be on that hamster wheel. So as you see here, it's pretty impressive. Like now here's a, a 10 part email series that might be for two months of outreach to every person that's ever signed up for your email list. And it, what it does is it continually brings trust. And um, so I'm just going to stop that so we can get back into it. But you see how like, this is incredibly powerful. The one thing that it doesn't say on here, and it's, it's not going to, is you want to have them come back to the website every single time you need to have a link that brings them back to the website. Because if they're not on your website, they're not going to give you money. So like if you bring them back to the website, so like all of this, maybe this is the email one is uh, maybe 500 words, but maybe you've also used ChatGPT or maybe you just are a good writer or whatever, or you have a video or a podcast series or whatever. And you might say, if you like this, check this out. And then you bring them back to the website. And then all of a sudden, now they're watching a video, they're subscribing to your YouTube channel, you know, they're doing what, like, it's all about getting that, that trust um, as part of the, the process. So the more that you bring them back to the site, the better. Uh, all right, so that's that one. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here. So is there, it, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Are we good? No, no questions just yet. Uh, but okay. of course, if anybody, Chris is showing a lot of appreciation for all that cool all <laughs> you right. just gave him the next few months of uh his marketing strategy there so <laughs> yeah there you go um and so just speaking of that like using chris's example this should i hope is resonating with any industry and any topic it's all the same you you just want to pair it to your niche and the the fact that this used to take a lot of work and now it's just a matter of being creative and being aware that this stuff is possible, you know, so it's, all right. So then the final one of the aware is engage. And that's where you want to get them to be a part of your community. 
Um, if you're a bigger organization, you can actually hire specifically for this. And the term that I like for that title would be community success manager. But in that could be you, that could be a chatbot, you know, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of ways to, to skin a cat these days in terms of, of engaging folks. But um, you know, if you, if you have the funds, a community success manager would be where it's at, or even consider put that hat on for one day a week or something of being a community success manager, whatever you want to do. But the more that you engage with the community, the better. And so there's two ways to do that. So one is obviously through social media, and that's you know getting putting the posts out there, putting your content out there, putting you know original thoughts, videos, you know whatever you want to put on social media. That's a really great way to engage with the community. The other thing that you'd want is actually to encourage them. And this is where the feedback and involvement would come from is you want to encourage them to do the same. So you don't want to be the one just creating the content. Why don't they create the content? So maybe you had a product or a service or uh, whatever that changed their life. Maybe they're willing to do a video and post that on their Instagram, or maybe they're willing to, you know, write a testimonial or, you know, like however you want to get them involved by getting them involved, they feel part of the community and they're much more likely to become a brand advocate for everything that you're, you're trying to do. It's incredibly hard to build a community, but once you have it, you see that like, those are the brands that really, really do well. And it's, it's really hard, uh, but with AI, it's not as hard to, to build a, an engaging brand. So another, another, I guess just one other like example would be is by using, um, you could use like Google forms or there's, uh, the survey monkey or, you know, there's all sorts of different ways that you can like send them surveys as well. They might be interested in that. You might, um, trying to think of a brand. I, I get those all the time where they're like, we'll give you $10 to fill out this feedback form or something like that. You know, like if you have the budget, getting that is also helpful as well. Cause then that helps, you know, steer you in the right direction as well. So just some thoughts on that. And I'm not seeing any uh, further questions on that. That's probably pretty straightforward. So that is, uh, so going back to the title of this whole, um, presentation was maximizing revenue using your website. And so I hope that you see that building the trust is important. The one thing that I haven't talked about is pricing. So when you think about the more trust you can build, the more likely they're going to do business with you. But also you have to think about your pricing model of, are you just like purely like, like I put in here, gut-based pricing, or is it on the value that you're providing? So it's, it's really important to take a step back and look at the value that you're providing and you know a, adjust accordingly. So if you think about if there is, if you do some research and your competitors are all selling this widget for 99 cents, but it's very transactional, it's just on Amazon and it's, you know, it's just purely transactional. But if you build a community and you price it at $10 a widget, but it's for a very specific case. You've already built all this trust and it's of course, hopefully better quality and all that kind of stuff. But if you, um, if you factor in more of the value it brings to their life, you can make more revenue through this whole process. So I hope that this kind of like this quadrant here kind of shows that as you build more trust, you can charge more. And then as you provide more value, you can charge more. So, you know, it's, it's really hard. You're, you're not just going to come out of the gate just charging, you know, astronomical prices. But if you think about like uh, Walmart versus REI. So if you wanted to get a kayak, if you went to Walmart, you're going to get a kayak. It's probably going to be 300 bucks. But you just like, you know that it's not that good. There's no trust because it's probably built like, you know, who knows how it's built. There's just, it's very hard to, to just, you know, you're, you kind of go into it knowing that it's not a good thing. <laughs> but if you go to REI, 
and they welcome you. You you have the membership there, and you have just a, a full thing, um, full really welcoming experience. You're going to be willing to pay three thousand dollars, four thousand for a kayak, maybe. So you know, it's just it's really important to to think about how you're approaching your your pricing. So taking in that whole trust building process through your website and then pairing it with your pricing, that's really how you maximize your revenue. Um, I'll leave you with one more story from this standpoint is there was, there's like a parable uh, where this one person uh, was a wedding photographer and they wanted to work less. They were fully booked. They wanted to, to work a lot less. And so they thought that if they doubled their prices, they would work half the time. But what ended up happening was they had such a good community and they were a good product that even by doubling the prices, they still were fully booked. <laughs> and so they doubled the price again and then they were fully booked and they doubled it again and fully booked. And now they're getting paid $20,000 a, a wedding and being flown all over the world. And it was purely because they had built a lot of trust and they had a good community and they, they provided a lot of value and they created a much better life for themselves versus, you know, just being in this hamster wheel. And believe me, <laughs> way easier said than done. You know, it takes a long time to get to this part, but if you can get to this part of the quadrant, you know, you're, you're going to do fairly well with your, your business. Uh, so let's just summarize it. So the aware model helps businesses grow by attracting the visitors, making them feel welcome, and then you have to offer them valuable content. By maintaining that communication, you're going to keep them coming back to the website and you're going to keep building trust. And in turn, you'll create, you'll go from what I call like a window shopper to a loyal fan. And so with that, it's, it seems fairly complex, but if you really just start breaking it down into those five stages, you're in a much better position to really maximize your web presence and just completely dominate in terms of whatever niche that you're in. So with that, do we have any questions? Um, let's see. So we got about 10 minutes so, for questions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, please, uh, Brad, again, remarkable. I, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm doing a lot on the back end here. I'm like, <laughs> but, uh, you know, trying to keep track, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm texting our team here at Nifty. Um, and I'm, you know, we're all like, Hey, you know, how can we use chat GPT for, uh, for the things that we do question for you though, in the aware for the aware, um, phases and stages, which, which stage do you think, um, uh, from your experience and from working with clients, that clients have the most challenges with, you know, which is there a phase that, you know, for the most part, you know, uh, maybe the, you know, like it just tends to be a trend that clients and customers and entrepreneurs and small businesses have a challenge really figuring out. For sure. And it's, it's the adding the value up until AI existed. So having a small business owner or even a marketer, you'd be surprised. Marketers, uh, people that even write for a living, everyone gets writer, writer's block sometimes. You just don't know what to write or create content on or do a podcast or a video or something. I, I, I would love to be able to do, even personally, I would love to do a video every single day, but sometimes I'm just like, I don't even know what to talk about. <laughs> like That's pretty hard to believe that I run out of things to talk about, but I do. And so that whole process of creating content is really, really hard. And all of the AI tools that are out there um, are ways to accomplish that easier. So historically, it would be this would be the hardest. But at the same time, I would argue that this is the most valuable out of any of the phases. Because if you think about what this does is when you just let's take even creating if you create a really, really good article that ranks well, you're going to get search traffic for the foreseeable future on that topic. You can have a call to action. You can then from that article, you could have a lead magnet. You can have them go to your e-commerce store. You can do, you know, what all sorts of different things. So this, the content creation piece of it is the hardest, but the most 
by far the most valuable piece of the whole whole puzzle. And now with AI, there's, like I said, no excuses not to create content. It's really just a matter of, of doing it at this point. Thank you, Brad. Man, that was, <laughs> this has all been valuable 100%. And you've added value to, to all of us today. So uh, I want to give our, our uh, audience uh, one last chance uh, for sure. Uh, as you guys are thinking, if you can, you can uh, put it in the Q&A in the chat. Uh, also, please let us know how we did today. I left a little Google form there. Uh, helps us out on uh, even making the experience even even better. Um, and so, but, um, Kenny, real quick. Um, yes. Uh, just to max out the time, I can do some more AI uh, tips on that. Sure, uh, sure, so, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to. I want to get the full full. Thank you. Here. Uh, absolutely. Sure. But but that's so that's the aware process. So now you kind of. No, it's all about building trust. And so, you know, I want to give you as much, just like my, my framework says, I want to give you as much valuable, at, uh, much value as humanly possible here. So, um, all right. So we'll actually, let me just show you a couple, couple tools. So there's jasper.ai is a really good content writing tool that will help you. Um, that's a really... Some of these are paid, so you know, just keep in mind, uh, Jasper or Jasper.ai, um, Copy.ai is a great one. That is really good. Um, and then there's one more that I'll do is Quillbot. These three, so I know I went through it quick, but Jasper.ai, Copy.ai, and then Quillbot.com. All three of these should help you create the content. So once you have that, then you can then start putting it in your website. So there's a few different ways, and I would be remiss to not mention that if you, so there's, there's three different, I guess, forms of content. There's text-based, there's audio, and then there's video. So text-based is great. It's going to work for SEO. It's going to, it's the, you know, it's the, the original version of, of just content on a website. But I also feel that with articles, um, it's, it's not the best medium in terms of, a lot of people don't wanna read, <laughs> unfortunately. And so audio is, has been really popular with podcasts and stuff like that, but going forward, video is the future. And so I, uh, if you start to go down the video route, I would highly recommend starting a YouTube channel and then putting those, when you go through this process, which you can, you know, like we can go in and say like, create a video outline for Medicare. And, and you can go and it doesn't even need to be good quality. I'd highly recommend getting a good microphone, but, and this, this one I'm using was probably like a hundred bucks. Like, you know, it's, it's not, not a huge expense, but if you have a good microphone, the, the lighting is important. And as you see, like we're in our like temporary studio right now, it's not the best, but at least the audio is good. And, you know, you're getting my message across. So, um, so here would be, I, I just stopped it, but here, if you don't know what to talk about on the video, you can just go into create a video outline for Medicare. Again, learn prompt engineering or email me. Uh, we have courses on it that we can, we can teach you. Um, but once you do create the video, upload it to YouTube. And then once it's on YouTube, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. Actually, Bing is probably gonna take it over at some point, but YouTube's huge. So YouTube is a ton of people go to YouTube for information. And that's where SiteCast. So this is the company that uh, my wife and I, we uh, have built over painstakingly many years, and we actually use a lot of uh, automation and AI to instantly build websites for video. So if you are interested in having a, uh, your YouTube channel be on a website, you, know, you can literally click this and in a couple, couple clicks, you can have a website for your YouTube videos, which will then be everything that I talked about. There's call to action features. There's all sorts of stuff. Um, it's super, super simple to use. 
But this would be, you know, I would be remiss not to mention this when it comes to creating content online. Everyone needs, in my opinion, everyone needs a YouTube channel and everyone should have a website for their YouTube channel. And so if you want to uh, check it out, this would be what I'd recommend. You just need to connect your YouTube channel and it will automatically create the website for you. I'll be search engine optimized, all that good stuff. So, um, so that is that. Um, all right, I got a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, I can go over it or I can go back to ChatGPT and talk a little bit more about that. So I don't see any questions popping up. And so I am going to talk a little bit about the, the concept of, so when you're creating this content for your website or your email list or whatever, the main thing is that whatever you put into it is going to be the same quality of what comes out of it. So if you just go in and say, write a poem, you know, it's like, what, like write a poem, it's going to just be something super generic. It's pretty cool. You know, it's way better than what computers could do from a poem standpoint in the past, but it's not going to be what, what something that would serve you compared to, uh, so I'm going to stop. So let's see. So if you instead go through a, a, a much more structured framework of telling the AI what it is. So you are a 18th century uh, poet and you are from England, England, and is that how you spell England? It's probably just because I don't have big. <laughs> and um, and you focus on romanticism, something like that, right there. Okay, so then you're telling the AI what it is, and then we can go in. So now it thinks instead of it's just I'm GPT four writing a poem, it now knows what it is, and so then you could then go in and say, write a I don't know, is limerick? Is, is, this is a weird example because I, I know like nothing about poems, but write a limerick about um, flowers. So then, oh, of course, ChatGPT went down. I mean, this is the problem with, I'll do the 3.5. So let me, so we do. So then, so here is, a very specific thing where, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's much more fine tuned to what you wanted. So now if you think about like, if you do that with Medicare, so if I say, if I do a new chat of, I'll just stick with 3.5 though. Um, so if I said, uh, generate a, or wait, I am an expert in Medicare based out of Wisconsin and I create videos for a um, 70 to 80 year old old widow widowers. So now you see that's much more fine tuned. So generate a video outline um, based on the top 10 things I should know before um, talking to my doctor. <laughs> this is just, I don't know anything about Medicare, but that would probably be something. So, okay, so here is then an outline for the top 10 things based on that information. So instead of just having it be generate a video about Medicare, this is very specific, or you could, you know, get even more specific. So the more specific you get, the better the, the output. So that's like the garbage in garbage out concept. So if you can put in uh, good stuff, you're going to get good stuff out. So I hope that helps for the most part of from a prompt design, you just want to be much more specific. I'll do one more here. Uh, let's see. So 
Um, if if it was like uh, write an article about entrepreneurship. So this is cool and good, but you see that it's like, ah, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty generic. And so instead, here, I'll just stop that. So instead, if I go in and I describe, I am an expert in uh, fitness and I focus on yoga. Actually, you probably should say you are an expert because you're trying to tell the AI what it is. You are an expert in fitness and you focus on yoga. Um, develop an outline for a video on unknown skills for intermediate um, people. So then, now all of a sudden, you have a much more specific situation going on. So it's just so much fun to really think about the prompts and what you're doing. Um, so like, you know, if, if I, if you think about it, if I hadn't put like intermediate, I doubt that, you know, uh, an outline for unknown skills would have mentioned, you know, backbends or something, who knows, like it's, it's all about really telling the system what it is and what you want. And I can go super deep into this. I'm just trying not to within five minutes, just confuse you. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep this like super light, but the, ultimately what I'm trying to get at is the, the upcoming skill going forward is the ability to interact with AI. And most jobs, I guess like most careers aren't going away, but they anybody that doesn't, like say a lawyer or whatever, if they lose their job because of AI, it's not going to be because be because of an AI bot eliminating them. It's going to be someone, some other lawyer using AI to eliminate them. So everybody's got to start adapting these situ these tools to their specific use case. And just remember that there's so many new problems to be solved. So whether whatever your industry or niche is, just look at what are those things that AI is not going to solve anytime soon and go in that direction and use AI to help with that and then use that whole cycle of, of life, the aware framework that you continually build trust with your audience and you start pairing all of that stuff together. It may take a while, but you're going to have a very loyal network. You're going to have a very you know solid uh, traffic generation strategy you'll get them in there and it'll just be like starting this flywheel that as if you've ever read good to great they talk about a flywheel it's really hard to start the flywheel but once it starts going it's really hard to stop the flywheel and so that's all of this that we're talking about is it takes a little bit of effort not as much as it used to before ai but it takes a lot of effort to to get that flywheel going but then the drip campaigns, the SEO, the various content strategies on the website, the lead magnets, all of the different, the, the videos that you have, hopefully on YouTube and on your website, brucecast.com, all of those are going to really help just build a flywheel that is unstoppable. So that's, that's my parting words. Uh, we're now at the, the 90 minutes. So Hopefully you enjoyed this. Um, this was a lot of content to go over uh, just for the fact that, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot. I could talk about this for forever. So I, I hope, I hope everyone liked it. Um, and I'll pass it back to, to Kenny. Well, Brad, thank you again. Thank you guys. If you can give Brad, show Brad some love in the chat. Also uh, by filling out our, our survey, it really helped us out. Brad, I've heard you talk about this for almost three hours now between the two workshops. It feels like 30 minutes, you know, so it went by yeah. so fast, man, and there's so much information, and uh, man, it, it was a pleasure just uh, getting exposed and hearing you talk about it in something so complex, uh, so simply, and uh, in a way that we all can understand it. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time out. 
uh, for sharing this information. We will get this information out, uh, uh, but uh, uh, nothing beats live, though, I got to say, you know, to be able to ask you directly. But, um, you know, but I, I think just being able to go back and, and kind of reviewing some of these things, it's been really helpful to, to have this and uh, really, really appreciate meeting you, man. This has been great. Thank you to uh, the Nicolette College folks and, and GRID uh, for bringing us together. And um, we look forward to the remaining four workshops uh, through, through the spring. We've put that uh, link in the chat for you guys. Uh, and uh, please, you know, um, register because it's it's uh, we're just getting started. But uh, what what a way to start! Thank you again, Brad. Appreciate you, uh, and I'll be in touch really soon. So thank you, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you. Yep. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Take care.